Within that framework of the reactionary national politics of the United States, it is instructive to analyze the stepped up and almost weekly attacks against the sovereign nation of Cuba by the Trump administration. Thus, I appreciate the opportunity to participate and share some perspectives on this latter issue. African American people have long had a long history of interaction with Cuba, as it has always been a part of the African diaspora and the Cuban people as common sufferers under the evil racist regimes that have been set up to serve US imperialism and not the Cuban people. Furthermore, during the 19th and early 20th century, African Americans learned that the struggles against racism could not be advanced by participating or collaborating with the United States imperialist ventures. This has been true in each period of Cuban history. Good examples during the slave period are Frederick Douglass's, Martin Delaney, and Henry Highland Garnett. And during the slave period, African Americans consistently showed their solidarity with the fight for abolition of slavery and independence from Spain. But within the United States, they knew to watch their own ruling class. Frederick Douglass encouraged African-American youth to go to Cuba and join the anti-slavery patriots fighting uh, during the 10-year war for independence doing, between 1868 and 1878. African-American uh, sister historian Lisa Brock instructs, quote, Cuba provides the blueprint or the basis for a better understanding of the key issues facing contemporary Black Americans and present day Cuban relations. This forces us to ask as we move forward, what lessons are relevant for the struggles in both countries in developing new forms of solidarity efforts between Cuba's African descendants and African Americans? You know, every society has a master narrative, the voice of hegemony. This often contains the story of the nation slash country, its origin and its stages of development and transformation including major, major figures and social movements. The following is the master narrative of, of what the government has done to undermine the Cuban revolution, which is encased and referenced in the language and practices of, quote, the embargo of what we call the blockade of Cuba, now extending into six decades of attempts by successive administrations to destroy the revolution. We cannot talk about what is currently happening in Cuba today, specifically in the era of COVID-19 and how the country is successfully defeating the virus without first acknowledging that for 60 years, 60 years, the United States government has waged unsuccessfully the longest trade embargo in history against another nation which does not follow the same template of sanctions against other nations. First imposed in 1960 under the Eisenhower administration, as some of you no, with the probation of exports of all products except for food, medicines, and medical supplies. The Cuban embargo is in essence a relic of the Cold War initiated by the capitalist West to undermine the socialist developments in the Soviet Union and China and by 1960 Cuba. In February of 1962, the embargo was significantly expanded by President Kennedy, who invoked his authority under Section 628 of the Foreign Assistance Act of 1961, and that was to establish and maintain a total embargo on all trade between the United States and Cuba. At the same time, the Treasury Department issued the Cuban import regulations prohibiting the importing of goods coming from or through Cuba. In March of 1962, the authority for the embargo was expanded to include the Trading with the Enemy Act, unlike most U.S. sanctions programs, which falls under the International Emergency Powers Act of 1977. Notwithstanding the ending of the Cold War with the collapse of the former Soviet Union and Socialist Republic in 1991, Congress in the years since has continued to pass and presidents have signed into law legislation that strengthens the embargo. The most notably of laws pertaining to Cuba enacted since the end of the Cold War are the Cuban Democracy Act of 1992. The Cuban Democracy Act, which we all know, as some of you know, is referred to as the helms Burton Authority, and that authorizes the president to impose sanctions on any country that aids Cuba. The helms Burton prohibits vessels that enter a Cuban port from loading or unloading any freight in the United States ports for 180 days following their departure from Cuba. Perhaps the most controversial provision of the helms Burton law is the section that prohibits foreign subsidiaries of U.S. corporations from doing business with Cuba because of its extraterritorial issues. 
Section 1706 has invoked criticism and of course protests, especially internationally from some of the US's closest allies. During the administration of former President Barack Obama, the United States and Cuba commenced steps towards improving relations between the two countries. However, nearly all of the advances that the Obama administration made and had some respect for mutual sovereignty and friendship have been reversed by the Trump administration, which shamefully sells weapons of mass destruction to nations such as Saudi Arabia, while criticizing Cuba for sending its doctors and nurses to nations throughout the world to help relieve the pain and suffering of people. The Trump administration's decision to partially activate Title III of Helms Burden harkens back to the days now of the now discredited Monroe Doctrine as it constitutes unlawful interference and meddling in the internal affairs of a sovereign nation in violation of a well-settled international laws and principles and should loudly be condemned by members of the United States Congress. In the past few years, the Office of Access Control has pursued multiple violations against U.S. persons for facilitating trade with Cuba. And during COVID-19, during the pandemic, we have witnessed the inhumanity and callousness of this administration of not only the citizens of its own country, but we further observe enforcements of sanctions against other countries, including Cuba. For example, in March 2020, a shipment of Cuba from Jack Ma, the founder of Alibaba, was not delivered because the airline, fearing breaching U.S. sanctions rules against the embargo, declined to take it. The shipment contained COVID-19 test kits, face masks, gloves, and ventilators. The airline Colombia Avianca recorded to, uh, reported to Cuba officials that, uh, that said that they declined to deliver the aid because one of its main shareholders was a U.S. company and could face legal actions for violating Helms Burton by doing business with Cuba. Last month, tightened more sanctions when the Treasury Department's Office of Foreign Asset Controls amended the Cuban Assets Control Regulations, now prohibiting United States persons from lodging in any of the State Department's announced list of 433 Cuban hotels, which the State Department says is owned and controlled by the Cuban government. And it even prohibits members of, of uh, the communist, of what the so-called Cuban Communist Party of their families from once staying in any homes of those individuals. In addition, the regulations were also amended to ex exclude imports of Cubans uh, alcohol and tobacco, which basically means that if you travel to Cuba under the 12 legally identified categories, you can no longer enter the United States with cigars of rum pursued, purchased in Cuba. But the greater and more troublesome impact is the prohibition on persons subject to U.S. jurisdiction from attending professional meetings, such as what we would be doing, and conferences in Cuba. Furthermore, the general licensing allowing participation in cultural performances, clinics, athletic, and other competitions are now excluded, prohibited. Most recently, the Office of Assets Control of the United States Treasury Department even imposed a fine on a Canadian company that was actually uh, uh, insuring Canadian travelers to Cuba, but because the company was based in the United States, <coughs> that company was, um, was fined something like $6 million for um, even uh, referring payments related to the island to its Cuban subsidiary. So the Helms Burden Bill is unquestionably the most draconian as well as the most controversial of the laws and, uh, and the embargo cannot be ended without congressional currencies. Moving forward, uh, during this period of COVID, um, first and foremost, Cuba has, as a socialist society where from the very beginning of the triumph of the revolution, has developed a healthcare system that's known throughout the world. And it's important to understand that we here in the United States are being denied access to that healthcare. Uh, Cuba has found it a, uh, a, in the process at this moment of uh, pursuing a uh, test, uh, a, a cure for COVID-19. We don't have access to that. And then if we were to compare what Cuba has done in terms of COVID-19, the country now out of a population of 10 million, uh, a little more, uh, uh, 5,398 people have recovered out of a population of 11.5 million. And that means that they're only, they're, unfortunately, their, their total death toll is only 123. And you compare that to what's happened here, particularly in the state of Georgia, 
uh, we will be reminded that uh, this country is, is put to shame in terms of comparing what Cuba is doing in terms of healthcare and, and taking on the struggle of COVID-19. In my final point, I would be remiss if I were not to mention that um, Cuba has expanded its international solidarity. Uh, the, therape the therapies that is being used around the world is being treated, that Cuba is using is being treated uh, with patients, particularly in helping older and more at risk populations. And I think the most encouraging breakthrough is what we've seen recently with the uh, Henry Reeves Brigade, which is the Cuban internationalist group of medical doctors. Uh, they're up now for a Nobel Peace Prize for next year. So at this point, it would be very important. Uh, we did put out a pamphlet that, I've, that we circulated uh, that lays out some of the things that you can do. And I think that one of the three of the most important things, there's a campaign going on at this point called Saving Our Lives Campaign. It's calling, uh, among other demands, to incorporate US, uh, the Cuba's interferon after 2B recombinant in clinical trials in the United States. The other thing that I think is important that everyone who is listening here and in the cities that we live in, we should be calling on our elected officials to demand an end to repeal the Helms-Burton bill or temporarily suspending the Cuban embargo, which would enable Cuba to obtain the humanitarian aid and medical supplies that it needs to respond to, to, to the coronavirus. I also would encourage people to consider joining the next NCBL delegation to Cuba and participate in exchanges with members of the National Union of Cuban Jurists who organize various national and international legal conferences and symposium. And of course, uh, to contact your local organizing uh, committees uh, to pass resolutions that, suppose, that support these initiatives while calling for an end to the blockade. If you refer to the pamphlet, we do list um, uh, all of the organizations in the US that are involved in solidarity efforts with Cuba and we encourage you to refer to the pamphlet and for other things that you can do to fight and struggle for an end to the blockade. Thank you very much.